So welcome to our course on Mastering GTAL Tools. A brief background on me. I had a traditional remote sensing education. I worked with desktop software, or does imagine Arc Info. That was my world around 2000. And after I did my master's, I was hired at Google. So still very early days of Google. They were just bought from a tiny startup called Keyhole. And once they came to Google, suddenly the data volumes quadrupled in a matter of weeks and it went into 100 times. So what they were doing data processing, maybe buying 10 scenes a day, it suddenly became 1,000 scenes a day. And to process all this data, you needed to build pipelines and automate stuff. And that's where in the early days, there were all these command line tools that we all had to learn and to automate the workflows. These tools were then moved to the cloud where they were processed automatically. Even till this day, a lot of the data processing happens at Google using these tools. And same goes with every satellite company. If you talk about to anybody working at major satellite companies, they'll be using these tools as part of their pipeline. And I spent almost 15 years at Google. This was my daily thing. Every day I would use these tools to do a lot of data processing. And I used to joke that if you wake me up at middle of night, I can cite a GDAL command line by heart, right? So this was my life for a few decades. And I want to share that with you. We learned a lot of inside tricks and found out how best to use these tools in a production environment. So I'm going to share that with you today. Vigna, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, this is Vigna Prohit and I have done my master's in geoinformatics. And during my master's, I started working on a thesis and started taking an interest in automation. And I don't know if anybody, there were any other libraries, but mainly we used to do everything automation with GDAL and NumPy, especially for rasters. And more than the powerful thing, I would like to tell that when we run the command on, you know, command line and we <laughs> see the percentage, it was so satisfying for me as a beginner. And it actually, you know, boost my interest in automating. So I hope the same thing happens for you. And so what is GDAL? GDAL stands, it's an acronym for this long thing called Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. Quite a mouthful. It is meant to be used as a software library. So if you're a software developer, you'll say, I need a way to read and write data, different geospatial data. So if I want to write, read some geospatial data, and do something with it, I would use this library. This library was developed because in geospatial world, we have so many different data formats. For every different purpose, there's a new format that gets invented. It has got its own strengths and weaknesses, but it, you know, people start distributing data in that way. And it becomes quite painful to be able to figure out how to read and write those data. So GDAL was invented as a unified way saying that, we can have support for all possible data formats. You can use this library and suddenly your software will have support for reading and writing this data. Right now, all major software, if you use QGIS, ArcGIS, any other software for geospatial data, they are using GDAL under the hood for reading and writing data. Because again, no, nobody has time to add support and learn about all these data formats. They just use GDAL and say, you handle the data input and output. And GDAL has become very good at doing this. It's got support for more than 200 formats. It's a de facto standard for doing work with geospatial data. It's an open source library, so can anybody can use it and build software on top of that. There's a complementary library called OGR. You might have heard of this. It used to stand for OpenGIS, Simple Features, Reference Implementation. Now it's just simply OGR. It was a separate project, which was meant for doing the same thing, but for vector data. So in vector data, we have shape files and CSVs and tab files. GeoJSONs, converting between them can be painful. So OGR was meant for an easy way to read and write those data. Now it's part of the GDAL project. The first two projects have merged, and the whole thing is now single project. So when you install GDAL, you get OGR and so on. So the technically, you should call the whole project as GDAL slash OGR, but mostly people just use GDAL, which includes OGR. The While the library is primarily used for reading and writing data in a software environment where software developers use it, they also come with a lot of command line tools, which they've built over the years, which can do a lot of things, very commonly used things by itself. So you have a pre-compiled binary that is released for all different platforms, and you can access those via command line. And these tools allow you to do a lot of data processing without writing any code. So why should you use this tool compared to your other GIS environment? Well, one is it's free and open source. You can run it very easily. Doing batch processing and automation is very easy. 
once you say, I want to do this five steps and into this input data, typically there'll be just a single command. They'll take the input data, apply some transformations, extract some subdata, write it to a database. Now, once you figure out the command and you can say, I want to do this every day automatically, well, just you know, run the command on a server every day and that it's done. You say, I have a folder full of thousand shape files or I have 10,000 image tiles. I want to run this on all of them, but it's a single command you can just go and batch process that. So again, automation batch processing is very easy. You can also run it on servers. It just installs on any Linux or Windows system. So you can just install it, run it on any server and start doing data processing. Since it's a command line thing, there's no GUI, there's no user interface overhead. So it typically runs faster. It doesn't have to maintain and render the data, it just does the data processing. They are also quite efficient implementation, so they are often faster than the equivalent that you use on the desktop. So there's a question, can it run on a VM? Yes, it can run on VM. You can run it on a Docker environment. They give a Docker image as well, and you can just do it in a VM as well. So again, very flexible environment. You can run it on any system. Another thing that you might want to consider using GDAL is when you are accessing this library through other tools, GDAL has so many options. The every data has hundreds of different switches and options. If you want to access some of them, which are not most commonly used, you don't have the option. So you can now use this command line tools, which expose all of the different options that are available to you. So you say, I want to apply better compression. I want to make sure my data is published in a, in a certain layout. So I can now use that and you have all those options available to you using the command line. Again, you can build ETL pipelines. Vector tools are quite efficient. You say, I want to build a dashboard where I'm every morning I'm fetching this new data, doing some data cleaning, selecting some columns, removing null values, transforming the data, and then loading to a database. And I want to do this every day. You can just write a single command that does all of that. And then every morning we just have a pipeline that loads your data into the database. We had somebody script pipeline during COVID where they were scraping the COVID data every day and had an OGR pipeline, just a single command that would do all the data cleaning and load into the database, which was powering a dashboard website. So again, you can do it very easily, very efficiently using those tools. And there are some things which are not available in other tools. There are, these tools offer some unique functionality, which currently no other software package offers. So if you want to do and sharpening efficiently, well, you can do this. There are certain other compression algorithms which are not available in other software. So again, you might want to use this for a certain functionality. Another thing that a lot of people use it is for doing datum conversions. Just today, somebody asked me, how do I convert datum from lipsoid datum to a orthometric datum? And again, those kind of transformation you can only do with GDAL and most software packages do not have those functionalities. So these are the reasons to use it. Learning this tool are also quite helpful. This is kind of a skill set that you need to be successful in the modern geospatial ecosystem. This is by Matt Forrest, and you can see if you want to become a data engineer, if you want to work with data, SQL, along with SQL, data processing and ETL is one of the top skills. And this is what you're going to learn. So this will help you become more efficient in data processing and learn how to build those ETL pipelines. Before that, I want to kind of address an elephant in the room. You've heard me saying GDAL, but you may have heard GDAL pronounced differently. If you click on this link, you'll be launched into this recording. This is a recording where some folks asked Frank Wormadam who created this library, who's the author of this library, it's like, how do you pronounce Chila? And let's see what he has to say. Frank, it's Frank Wormerden himself. So, so Frank, Sam and I were just chatting. We get this question a lot when we talk to users, and there was just some discussion about this on Twitter. <laughs> how do you pronounce the acronym for geospatial Data library. We're talking to Frank Warmerdan, the creator of the thing. How does Frank, what does he call the thing? Well, so I've actually pronounced it two different ways over my history. When I first founded the, the library, I actually imagined it being spelled geospatial object oriented data abstraction library. So I sure. call it like Google, but then I didn't really want such a long prefix for everything. So I just went with the GDAL, but I still said Google. And I have to say, back in those days, 
Google was small and cool and sounding a little bit like it seemed clever to me. This would be 1998 or so, maybe 1999. Mm -hmm. I guess it was 1998. In 2011, I went to work for Google, and when I said Google there, mm -hmm. everybody's like, thought I was talking about Google, of course. So I actually started saying it GDAL after that. So now I say GDAL. There you go. You heard it, folks. That's the story. That's the gospel. Everyone is right. So this used to be quite a bit of debate in the geospatial world. I used to go to conferences and Frank would get up on stage and said, Google. And I never had the courage to ask him. Finally, he worked at Google. I had a chance to meet with him, worked on the project together. And then we finally figured out that Google used to be the earlier acronym, which was the uh, geospatial object oriented data library. And that's why he still said that, but now everybody just says it's GDAL. So a bit of history around these tools. And again, a fun fact, maybe if you meet somebody else in the geospatial world, something to share with them. Let's learn about what this course contains. The course is divided into four sessions. Today, we're going to get started, get familiar with the command line, get to understand how the command line works. We'll type some commands, we'll run it, we'll explore different options and say, once we apply different options, how does the command change? To do this, we're going to take some animation data and work with this. We're going to learn about how to apply compression. We're going to learn a lot about compression. This is one of those topics, once you understand it, it's going to have a really big impact on how you do data processing. So we'll also learn about this new modern data format called Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. This is something that you should all be using right now. So if not, you'll get an introduction to it. We'll see how to create and how to use logs in your workflows. Then we'll learn how to work with aerial and raster imagery, satellite imagery. So we'll learn if you have a large amount of aerial imagery, let's say you have five terabytes of aerial imagery. How do you even view it? How do you even process this data? So we'll learn, I'll share some of those tricks I learned to efficiently process this data, find out problems with this data, what you projected, clip it, and so on. We'll learn about how to process satellite data. We'll work with Landsat data and say, how do we create, take multiple, multiple bands images, stack them into different band composites. We'll learn how to do some raster algebra, algebra compute some index like NDVI, do pan sharpening, and then you know, save the data into different formats. Then we'll cover some niche topics. These are topics that are not widely used, but if you need to do some of this, this will be a game changer for many of you. One of the things that GDAL tools offer is a way to read WMS and WMTS layers. So if you have used those web services, you know sometimes it can be quite painful to work with the uh, services which serve tiles for the region that you want to look at. So this is great to be used online, but what if you are in an offline environment? You're going and you don't have internet connection. You're doing some work in rural regions and you want to access a service. GDAL allows you to treat WMS just as another data source and convert it to any other format like GeoTIFF. So you can quickly download a subset of that service locally for use. This is critical for a lot of users who want to use this, will learn how to do this. Georeferencing, you can automate your georeferencing task using GDAL. Many people who work with weather data, they are given a bunch of JPEG files and say, you do this, you can apply automated georeferencing on that and, and you create geospatial rasters so you can work with them, them more effectively. We had a participant who does some weather data processing and they had a few hundred lines of custom Python workflow that didn't work very well after taking this class. They replaced the entire workflow with three lines of GDAL commands, which work beautifully and efficiently and it's running in the production. Right? So you'll learn, if you need to do this, this will be a game changer for a lot of you who want to do georeferencing and work with WMS data. Then we'll learn some ETL basics. We'll start working with OGR tools and vector data. Once we build a pipeline, we'll say, now let's see if we can do some geoprocessing in spatial queries. I'll give you a brief introduction to SQL, SQL. So you can do spatial queries on any data set using OGR commands. We'll solve a pretty complex spatial problem using command lines and the command line tools that it offers. And at the end, we'll teach you how to run these commands in a batch, how to use all the compute power you have in a system, how to do parallel computing using those tools, how to run these commands on multiple inputs, and so on. So that's the course structure. We'll start slow, and then we'll pick up pace as we go along. There are two distinct set of programs, GDAL and OGR. We will learn this command called GDAL info. All of you type this while you're testing your GDAL install. This is a command that allows you to find information about a particular raster data set. There's a question, are you able to see the contents of a zip file without unzipping using GDAL? Yes, GDAL can list data set which are inside the zip file. You have to prefix the path with VSI zip. It's called something called a virtual data set. So you can actually have a zip folder with some file inside, 
you can directly read it, transform it, and all of this will work. But again, that becomes a little more complex. So right now we're unzipping it just to make it easy. But in future, you will say, I have some file on some server, which is zip file, you can download it or not. Even in the download, you can access that some file inside and transform that. So it supports that. So for the GDAL programs, we have a program called GDAL info. This allows you to get information about any raster data sets. This is a simple command, but very widely used command. Whenever you find your raster data set is misbehaving, it's, you know, if you open it in a GIS, it's not sitting at the correct place it should be. It's, you know, giving some error. GDAL info will reveal a lot of those errors. It'll say, oh, it's missing a projection. Oh, it's having this issue with some bags. So very useful command to know more about your data set. Also, this can compute image statistics, it can extract image information. I've used it for so many projects where I have 10,000 files sitting in some folder. I want to know, are they the same resolution or do they have different resolution? What's the projection? You can run a command in batch. It generates a nice CSV file with all the information about those files. And you can say, oh, there's one file with a different projection. And I can just discard that, right? So very useful to find information about raster data set. It's also very fast. GDAL Translate, this is the bread and butter of doing raster data processing. This takes any data set, raster data set that's supported by GDAL, applies some transformations and write a new data set. So any format conversions or subsetting, you'll be using GDAL Translate. GDAL Warp is the reprojection utility. So if you want to change the projection, if you want to reproject the data, you want to clip the data, this is what you would use. If you want to change and resample the data, GDAL Warp would be used. Sometimes it's confusing whether to use Translate or Warp, if you're changing the pixel grid and if you're changing the projection, you should use GDAL warp. If you're simply taking the retaining the same projection and pixel grid and you are subsetting or transforming the data for a format, GDAL translate is the command to use. So these are the three main GDAL commands. During the course, we'll also get introduced to a bunch of other commands that the library comes with. GDAL add -on, this is GDAL add overview. So this allows you to add image pyramids to access the data much more efficiently. GDAL T index, file index. If you have a bunch of files and you just want to know the bounding boxes, you run this, it'll generate a shape file containing all the bounding boxes of shape of your data set. I've used this for things like I have, somebody says, I have a lot of raster files in this folder or this cloud bucket. You just run T index, you just see bounding boxes for every type and say, this is where the data is distributed. Right? Very useful to know where your data is located. GDAL build VRT, we'll learn about virtual rasters. GDAL dem. If you have elevation data, this creates a bunch of products like hill shades, contours, which you can generate from them. Rasterize to convert data from vector to raster. We have, these are the tools that we're going to cover in the course. There are a bunch of other tools. We have those in the supplement of the course. We're not going to go through exercises, but they exist. GDAL contour for creating contours out of the thing. After GDAL contour for creating contours from DMs. GDAL grid for doing interpolation. You have point data, I want to create IDW grid. GDAL grid is the command for this. GDAL transform for projection transformation. Near black, very useful commands. That if you have image artifacts, JPEG compression artifacts, this will remove those. GDAL location info, SRS info, again, querying the data set about specific things, changing the configuration and managing the data set. GDAL view shed, really useful command. It can compute the view shed of any point based on a DM. So you say, I have this really high risk DM. I want to know I'm standing on top of this building. What places I can see? And you can compute that using this command. Very useful for in, in cell tower deployment or visibility analysis, which allows you to run this command. And we are create just to create an empty data set. The GDAL tools also comes with a bunch of Python scripts. So these use Python to invoke the GDAL binaries inside. So again, they use the GDAL bindings, but via Python, they do uh, also quite helpful to do a bunch of things. GDAL merge to merge different data set. GDAL CALSI for doing raster algebra. They'll be using this extensively when we work with satellite data. Pan sharpen, apply pan sharpening algorithm, and a whole bunch of other things which we don't use, but they exist. And we can give you information about them as during the course. There are OGR programs, so equivalents of the RAST commands on the vector side. OGR info, okay, find information about the vector data set. OGR to OGR, similar to GDAL translate, but works on vector data. So take a vector data, transform it to another vector data. OGR merge, merge different files. Again, very common thing. I have 100 shape files, I will merge them. Single command, you get all of those files merged. OGR layer algebra, this is a newer tool, allows you to do spatial analysis with two different layers. I want to intersect or union or clip. You can do this using that. 
There are a bunch of other OGR programs, OGR team decks. Similarly, you have a bunch of shape files. You want to know where they are. So look at the bounding boxes of those. Linear reference to do some linear referencing as well. So how do we run these commands? There are many, many different ways to run those commands. The most common way that people use this is through a terminal. This is what we'll be doing in this course. You open a terminal, you type the command, and there are a bunch of options. You say, I want to run this command with this options on this input and write my output there. You specify all those things as a text on a command line and you run it, it runs those commands and generates this output. So this is the most common way to do this. So you, you can specify the input and output along with options. That's a typical pattern of these commands. You say command name, input, output, and options. You can do pipelines. So for example, if I have four commands that you need to run as a pipeline. So first do this, then run this other command, then do this other command, and finally run this other command. You can just put them in a script. You say, you know, I have a shell script or a Windows batch script. Let's put these four commands together, run the batch script, just run those four commands. So building a pipeline is nothing as fancy. Just put those commands in sequence one after the other, run it as a batch file, and that's your pipeline. You can do batch processing where you say, I have figured out command to process one file, I have thousands of those. You can execute this using a for loop, using Python or Cal scripting. We're going to show you an example of doing that. You can also run these commands on a notebook environment. So if you're familiar with Jupyter notebooks, if you're doing data science, you might be in a Jupyter notebook environment. You can run these commands in a Jupyter notebook environment. This allows you to kind of have a workflow that is reproducible, that you can say, I did this, did this, and all of those are documented. Also, during your data science workflow, you said, I now need to generate some contours. Instead of writing, importing some Python library and doing this, you can just run GDAL contour there in the notebook. And it's going to use the, it's going to run this command on the shell that the notebook is running and generate the output there. So super helpful, but you can run the notebook as well. We have this entire course available as a notebook. I'm going to show you to, to you at the end of the class. So again, you can say, I did all of this. I want to just run it in a notebook. You can run this whole course in a notebook. So we don't have to install anything. You can run on any environment that you want. When you run the commands, you'll be asked to specify some options. So let's say you're running this gdal translate command. It'll be, say, specify your input, specify your output. Along with that, you need to give some options. There are two different kinds of options. There'll be a long syntax, so dash dash help, dash dash version, dash dash formats. These are the options which are called long options. So two dashes, they are common across all the programs. And they're typically things like, I just want to know some help about this program, or I want to know what format it supports. So they are not used for command-specific processing. They're more kind of program-specific, GDAL-specific information that you could get. Most commands will have this short syntax where you can provide the options with a single dash. So you'll have option like this, dash OF which stands for output format. So it'll say GDAL translate dash OF and you specify the output the format. And you can have a bunch of those options with the short syntax. So when you're running the commands, most of the commands will have these options in form of a single dash. They are also called flags. So sometimes you will see me referring to them as flags. There are also options. You can think of those options. Another people refer to them as flags as well. So you have a flag dash OF or you have an option named dash OF. With that, we will now dive into our course material and start working with the data.